So today we're going to be talking about the uh, Christological controversy that leads up to the uh, ecumenical councils of Ephesus and Chalcedon. And I'll spell those words when we get there, so don't worry about it yet. But basically what we're looking at now is um, fourth, later 4th fourth and 5th century Christology. Now, in uh, a lot of the books you'll read on this, authors make a distinction between the Trinitarian controversy and the Christological controversy. Now, this is not a distinction that I'm that concerned about, because to me it's all Christology. I mean, if we didn't have the problem of explaining who Christ is, you wouldn't have the doctrine of the Trinity. But if you're going to make that distinction, the Trinitarian controversy is really all about um, Primarily the relationship between the Father and Son, but then of course, you know, along comes the Holy Spirit and they eventually have to get around to that as well. The Christological controversy, technically speaking then, takes that one step further and talks about, okay, if then the Son is the second person of the Trinity, and if now we've talked about the relationships between the persons of the Trinity, that there is unity and distinction within the Trinity, how does that, what does that have to say about the two natures of Christ, the divine nature and human nature within the person of Christ? In other words, um, if, the, if the basic Trinitarian problem is how to balance unity and distinction in the Trinity, then the Christological problem is how to balance unity and distinction within the person of Christ, in, you know, the two natures. How are the two natures one person. How are they unified as one person? But at the same time, how are the two natures distinct? So that the divinity retains its distinction without undergoing change, right? Because, you know, we've seen from the beginning that divinity has to be immutable. Divinity can't change. So, um, we're going to talk about uh, some of the theologians that were involved in this controversy and we're going to lead ourselves up to the next two ecumenical councils. If you have in front of you, or if you have the handout on 4th century Christology, you'll notice that on one side was Arius, and we dealt with the Arian controversy already. On the other side is someone we haven't really talked about yet. And this is Apollinarius. Wow, it's nice to write on a clean chalkboard. <laughs> Apollinarius of Laodicea. Now, um, his dates are uh, like 310 to 390, so he's solidly in the 4th century. Um, we haven't really talked about him yet, but he comes up really uh, around the same time as the Cappadocians. In fact, he was sort of a pen pal of Basil of Caesarea, and the two of them discussed how to interpret the concept of homoousios, or consubstantiality. And um, Apollinarius seems to begin within the uh, Nicene, or Orthodox camp, but then um, sort of in reacting against Arius, because he's, he's an anti-Arian, right? But in reacting against Arius, uh, from the perspective of the middle, he sort of overreacts and goes to the other extreme. And so you can see if Arius was on this side of the board, the pendulum is going to swing over to here, and we're going to meet Apollinarius over on this side of the board. Um, now, if you uh, think about what Arianism did with anthropology, in other words, uh, an Arian anthropology is a very optimistic anthropology, an anthropology that says humans can be perfect. And um, because, you know, it, it assumes that, that Jesus was a human being who achieved some sort of perfection based on an adoptionist model. Okay, fine. But the scary part of that for the Orthodox, for the Nicenes, is that if Jesus can um, progress toward perfection, he could also regress. In other words, he, the possibility remained that he could sin. Now... That's not necessarily such a big deal for us today. I mean, a lot of people today would assume that Jesus could have sinned, um, and he just didn't. But back then, the idea that Jesus might have sinned and thereby 
might have uh, disqualified himself as savior of humanity. That was a scary thought. That was a thought that, you know, something that just, you know, was inconceivable. Um, so Apollinarius wants to uh, describe Christ in such a way that it was, it was utterly impossible for him to sin, even if he wanted to. Now, um, Apollinarius reasoned, though, that um, the only way Christ could perfectly avoid sin and consistently always uh, resist temptation. And, and the only way that, in, in a way that you're sort of guaranteed that Christ could avoid temptation, is if the part of him that has to resist temptation is not the human part. In other words, if Jesus has a human mind, that human mind is eventually going to give in to temptation. So what Apollinarius reasons is that in order for, for you to have that guarantee that Jesus could never sin, he must not have a human mind. So for Apollinarius, the human mind in Jesus is replaced with the divine logos, or the divine mind. Um, and so, uh, because in a way Apollinarius reasons, well, wait a minute, you know, if Jesus has these two natures, human and divine, and if each nature has its own mind, the divine mind being the Logos, and the human mind being the, the, the human mind, if each nature has its own mind, its own will, I think I just lost my battery, um, if each nature has its own mind or its own will, then does that make Jesus schizophrenic? You know, Does that make Jesus of two minds? And, um, and so he thought, well, that sounds to him like like there's not enough unity then in the person of Christ. That, that, it sounds like Christ isn't one person anymore. He's two persons or one schizophrenic person or something, right? And so ultimately what Apollinarius decided was that he, he came to believe that basically the divine logos replaced the human mind in Jesus. So that the divine mind could hold down the body, suppress it, and keep it in, um, in check so that it, it could not sin. Sort of like um, my, my church history professor used to say it like this, like, like putting a Cadillac engine in a Volkswagen. You know, back then Volkswagens weren't that great, but uh, now they're better cars. So uh, let's, let's, let's say it um, like if you were to put a Corvette engine in a Ford Focus. Now, you know that wouldn't work, really. But, I mean, that's the idea of the, you know, the divine mind being inserted into the human person. Now, what, what's the problem with that, though? To anticipate the, you know, somebody in the middle saying, looking at that, thinking, oh, what, what problem might you see in that? Divine mind replaces the human mind. Sorry? They're not equal. Well, I mean, what's not equal about it? You're right, but I want you to be more specific. What's not equal about it? Yeah, right. There is no human mind, so he's not fully human. So here again, we're on this side of the board. We're losing the humanity of Christ because uh, uh, a Jesus in which the human mind has been replaced is a Jesus who is not fully human. And so... Um, the, uh, the, the Christ, then, is one who has flesh, but not really full humanity. So for Apollinarius, the Logos puts on flesh, which is kind of biblical language, but for him it means like, you know, sort of wearing a skin suit. Remember the movie Men in Black? Right? The alien comes down, and there's that guy, Edgar, right? And he... Basically sucks the insides out of Edgar and then wears his skin. And, and the wife later says it was like someone else was wearing an Edgar suit, right? Well, that's kind of Apollinarius as Christ. You know, he's wearing a human suit, but he's not really human because on the inside he's divine. And so, so Apollinarius as Christ. It, now, Apollinarius himself would would fight this. You know, he he would disagree. He would probably say no. Uh, you know, this this Christ is human and everything. But the critique from the middle is going to be, nah, what we're looking at here is a Christ who is not fully human. He is fully divine, but he's not fully human. And so in a way, 
we've lost part of the human nature. So we don't have two natures anymore here. Um, is it, what is it, one and a half natures? I don't know. I'm just throwing stuff out there. I wouldn't, you know, take that too far. But it, you see how it's somehow less than fully two natures. Um, and in fact, uh, there is only one will. So whatever you have of the divinity and the humanity, you, uh, the will or the mind is divine, not human. So there's one will, not two. Um, there's actually a word for this in Greek, monotholite. means one will. Okay, so Apollinarius is Christ then, is not so much the word becomes human, or the it's more of the, the incarnation is not a becoming human. Incarnation is more of a deifying of the flesh. Um, sometimes this is referred to as a word flesh Christology. Now I'm not big on these labels, but in case you read that, I'll throw it out there for you. But what word flesh means is flesh as opposed to human. In other words, the, the more mainstream alternative to this would be called word man, and pardon the um, not so inclusive language, but that's usually what it's called traditionally. But in that case, in, in the case of word man, the word man means human, as in fully human. In this case, then, by contrast, flesh means just the flesh, but not the full humanity. So anyway, if you see those terms, that's what, uh, that's what you're looking at. So it's, you know, it's interesting because what you, what, you have, what you had with Arius was, with Arius you had a situation where it was like the flesh earned the indwelling of the word or, or something like that, right? What you have with Apollinarius then is the word deifies the flesh. But neither of those would, would be considered by the, by the mainstream, would be considered an adequate interpretation of the word became flesh, or the word became human. And that's what the mainstream wanted to hold on to, was not just a putting on, but a becoming, and a becoming human. Um, yeah, I'll get to you in a second there. So uh, the other interesting thing is, is that whereas Arius conceived of a Christ with one will, although that will was human, Apollinarius also conceived of a Christ with only one will, except for him, the will was divine. The mainstream is going to say, no, he has to have two wills. He has to have both a human will and a divine will. Because in a sense, when he's in the garden saying, you know, um, not my will, but yours, when, when the human will is... Um, submitting itself to the divine will, the divine will, the will of God is the divine will in Christ. So, um, so there has to be a human will and a divine will. So the, the mainstream is going to have two wills. Arius had one will, although it was human. Apollinarius has one will, but in this case it's divine. So he's sort of gone to the other extreme. Now, Adrian, you had a question. Yeah, I guess, so the whole humanity thing is... Is it implicit in any of the Orthodox writings, or, or maybe even just implied, that this that Christ could have failed them? With is that is that a part of his? Yeah, but that, yeah, I said that up front. That that what scared Apollinarius was that he you know he reasoned if Arius was right, and Christ could progress, then Christ could also fail. He could have sinned, and that would have disqualified him as savior. And so Apollinarius wants to wants to describe Christ in such a way that it would be impossible for him to sin. So that was, yeah, that was the point. How does, kind of the motivation. So yeah. how does Orth or, I don't know if you're going to already go there, but yeah. is, is orthodoxy, how do they fall in their faith? Well, that's a good question because, I mean, the Nicenes at the time would probably also have wanted to say Christ could not have sinned even if he wanted to. They just didn't go so far as to try and describe you know, that, that that's because he didn't have a human will. Um, now, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, um, how the, the two natures or the two wills interact. So we're going to go down that road tonight. But, um, but, yeah, I mean, like I said, for us today, it might not seem like such a big deal. We could say, well, you know, 
Jesus could have sinned, he just didn't. Uh, some people think he did, but most people traditionally would say he, you know, he, he could have, he just didn't. And and he could have because he was tempted, and, and you know, we believe the temptation was real. Um, but back then, uh, most people, even in the mainstream, would probably say, no, he couldn't have sinned even if he wanted to, because the divine will would suppress the human will or something like that. Yeah. So, um, so in Apollinarius' Christ, there is no human will. So Christ really has no free will as a, as a human being. Um, and so, uh, whereas, you know, in the mainstream, you, they might say that the Logos uh, represses, or, or maybe a better way to say it is reinforces the human will. For Apollinarius, the Logos replaces the human will. So there is no human will. And so again, one will only is called monothelite. And for Apollinarius, that one will is divine. Now again, Apollinarius himself, when charged with diminishing the humanity of Christ, would counter and say that's not what he intended. But again, from, you know, the, pers from the perspective of the middle, uh, it does look like that. But what Apollinarius is doing here is pushing the unity of the two natures, pushing, pushing the two natures in the direction of unity. And what you're going to see when we have this, um, when we have all these squares filled in, is that when it comes to the, the unity and distinction of the two natures within the person of Christ, the farther you go in this direction is more unity, the farther you go in this direction is more distinction and less unity. Uh, so you'll see that as, as uh, the next few minutes unfold. Um, and, and so for Apollinarius, he's pushing it towards the unity such that the two natures really sort of overlap. And you don't really have two full natures anymore. The divine nature kind of overlaps or overshadows the human nature, even replacing part of the human nature. Now, Apollinarius was condemned as a heretic, or his teachings were condemned as heresy, at the Second Ecumenical Council of Constantinople in 381. Uh, okay, so now, the pendulum is going to swing back over to here, because what we have here now is a bishop of Constantinople named Nestorius, And uh, now we're jumping kind of ahead in time because he becomes bishop in 428. So now we're into the 5th century. So I don't want you to get the impression that these guys all sat around the same table. They're reacting against each other, but, you know, we're kind of going, we're into the 5th century now. Um, okay, so Nestorius reacts against what Apollinarius was selling, right? But again, from the perspective of the middle, he overreacts and goes to the other extreme, and the pendulum swings this far. Now, the problem is, is that the, far, the farther we get into the details, uh, the, you know, the nitty-gritty of these controversies, the more difficult it becomes to determine whether someone like Nestorius really taught what he was accused of. And the latest scholarship is that, you know, probably Nestorius may have gotten a bad rap. And he was probably a lot closer to the middle, to the Nicene or Orthodox position, than he historically has gotten credit for. So I'm going to give you kind of an overview here, but remember what we're doing is sort of simplifying these positions so you understand the concepts. Um, a lot of people now would say Nestorius is, you know, shouldn't have been uh, considered a heretic, but, you know, um, that jury's still out. At any rate, uh, it's not really clear how far Nestorius pushed this, but what he does, as you can see by where I put him on the board, is he's going to react against uh, Apollinarius' emphasis on the unity by emphasizing the distinction between the two natures. Nestorius wants to keep the two natures more separate than Apollinarius is doing. Nestorius thinks Apollinarius is confusing the two natures. Right? And we're losing the distinction, which means, you know, that it's questionable whether that compromises the immutability of the divine nature, right? So Nestorius wants uh, the two natures to remain distinct. 
And so he pushes it in that direction to the point where he, he really seems to have denied any real union of the two natures, in the sense that the, the union of the two natures is really only on the level of the cooperation of the two wills, right? So, he does have two natures, and he does have two wills, but the question becomes, how are those two natures unified? How are they one? And what Nestorius seems to have argued is that the real union between the divinity and the humanity is simply on the level of the wills that the humanity submits to and cooperates with the will of the, of the divine nature. Um, so if you think about, uh, think about it this way, imagine, if you can imagine in your head the two natures of Christ, and the divine nature uh, has the human nature on a leash. And, it, you know, and so it's kind of a short leash, too. So that Nestorius' way of explaining how come Jesus could never sin is because the divine nature has the human nature on a short leash. But the leash is really the only thing connecting the two natures. Right? Are you going to say No. Okay, that's all right. But I saw a hand going up. That's okay. Um, so again, it's not clear how far he really took this, but he seems to be swinging back toward Arianism in some ways, because whereas Arianism talked about the unity of father and son as a union on the level of cooperating wills, now Nestorius is talking about the unity of the divine and human within the son, on the level of cooperating wills. But again, it's not, uh, it's not a, a, a unity on the level of Christ's very personhood. And in fact, Nestorius, when talking about the two natures, used the Greek word prosopon, which is sometimes translated person, so that it sounded like sub to, to a lot of people that what he was really talking about was two persons. Like, as if somehow he was suggesting a four-person trinity. Father, Holy Spirit, divine nature of the Son, human nature of the Son. Right? Now, I don't think that's really what he meant, but it sounded like that to some people. And so, basically, uh, they, you know, a lot of people saw this as too much distinction between the divine and human within the person of Christ, and not enough unity. And so, if... Um, if Apollinarius' Christ is like a, a, a Corvette engine stuck in a Ford Focus, right? Nestorius' Christ is like two men in a horse costume, right? It's not, it's still really two, right? I mean, and, you know, pity the one who's got to be the back end, but that's the humanity, right? Because the, you know, the divine nature has to lead, so, but it's still not really one, um, uh, you know, another way I like to think of it, because I'm Italian, uh, like Italian dressing, oil and vinegar, you know. You can, you can shake them up, you can mix them up, but leave them set for a while and they'll separate out. They, they're not really permanently unified. Um, so that means, of course, that Nestorius is going to be uncomfortable with a couple of important theological concepts, one of which is communicatio idiomatum. The idea of the borrowing of, of idiomatic properties, borrowing and loaning from, from humanity to divinity, right? Um, this idea that the divine nature loans glory to the uh, human nature, and the divine nature borrows frailty from the human nature, right? Well, Nestorius doesn't like that idea because that's too much unity. He wants them to be more separate than that. The other thing Nestorius doesn't like is a tradition that, that we already have uh, in the church, a tradition of using a particular title for Mary, the mother of Jesus. The title in Greek is Theotokos. Theo from God, tokos meaning the bearer, the God-bearer, or translated into English, mother of God. Now, there's already a tradition of calling Mary mother of God, 
And I don't know, you may have even noticed it when you were reading the life of Antony, written in about 360. So even from the 4th century, it's, you know, it's already there. Now, um, Nestorius is uncomfortable with this because, here's, here's the issue. The question is, when Jesus was in Mary's womb, was only the human nature of Christ in Mary's womb, or were both natures of Christ, divine and human, in Mary's womb? Was the divine nature of Christ circumscribed within the womb of Mary? Nestorius wants to say no, because to him that's too much unity between the two natures. He wants to say, well, let's call her mother of Christ. Let's call her Christotokos. We can call her mother of Christ. Because for Nestorius, she's only the mother of the human nature of Christ. But for many people in the church, Mary is the mother of both natures of Christ, and so she can be called mother of God uh, by appropriation. Whatever you can say about the second person of the Trinity, you can say about the whole Trinity. Now, we know we're not saying she's mother of the whole Trinity. She's not the mother of the Father. But to somebody like Nestorius, he worries that it sounds like that. So there are a couple things I want you to see and get out of this. One of which is this controversy over the title Theotokos for Mary might sound like it's about Marian devotion, might sound like it's really about Mary, but it's really about Christ. It's really a, a Christological issue. The Christological issue is whether or not the divine nature of Christ was circumscribed in the womb of Mary. Did Mary hold in her womb both natures of Christ? And the mainstream is going to want to say yes, because otherwise the two natures are not unified enough. If the two natures are as unified as we think they are, then they cannot be separated in that way, and that within the womb of Mary, both natures were circumscribed, human and divine. And that really becomes the issue. Um, now, we can, uh, let's see, I don't, I wish I had chalkboard right here in the middle, but I don't. Um, but on your handout, you'll notice I've listed in the middle, one of the people I've listed is Cyril of Alexandria. Cyril was Bishop of Alexandria from 412 to 444. So he's uh, Bishop of Alexandria when Nestorius is Bishop of Constantinople. Now, Cyril of Alexandria is, you know, one of these guys who, <clears throat> You know, there's some good things about him, there's some bad things about him. He discriminated against and attacked uh, Novationists in Alexandria. He kicked all the Jews out of Alexandria. Um, so you wouldn't call him a super nice guy. But um, he is going to move us along towards uh, the, the language for describing Christology, towards the ecumenical councils. Um, now, if... Uh, you know, if Cyril had to pick one or the other of these, he'd probably be closer to Apollinarius. But, um, but eventually, he, he gets into it with Nestorius over the issue of Theotokos, over the issue of whether Mary is appropriately called Mother of God. And so eventually, he, at this stage of the game, sort of um, represents the middle. Now, Cyril and Nestorius argued with each other by letter. But of course, they couldn't sort it out. Both stood their ground, and neither one gave in at all. So what do they do? Well, you can probably see where this is going. They appealed to the Bishop of Rome, whose name was Celestine, if you're writing this down, it's C-E-L-E-S-T-I-N-E. -E. Um, Celestine of Rome. Now, again, look at how we have another stepping stone along the path of the, the evolution of the Bishop of Rome towards the office of the papacy, which we'll talk about more in detail later, but I want you to see this. Um, two Eastern bishops, bishops of metropolitan cities, Constantinople and Alexandria, they can't agree, they appeal to the Bishop of Rome, who is becoming, has become, sort of the, you know, the last court of appeals, the arbiter over other bishops, even over other metropolitans. So Celestine sided with Cyril, Saw that coming. Um, a synod was held in Rome, which condemned Nestorius as a heretic. Uh, a similar synod was held in Alexandria, which did the same. 
And so um, Nestorius is considered a heretic. Again, there are, um, you know, there's political issues here as well in terms of, you know, a power struggle between Cyril and Nestorius. So again, it's probably the case that Nestorius is getting a bad rap. And it's not clear just how far he went with this. But his followers, people who came after him, whom we will refer to as Nestorians, they pushed it even further in the direction of emphasizing the distinction between the two natures. And so, um, if, if Nestorius didn't have the concept uh, of, of a sort of two-person Christ, his followers probably did, and really separated the divine nature and the human nature out to the extreme, so that there's, there's almost nothing connecting them. Um, you know, and one of the reasons, of course, again, is to sort of protect the divinity uh, and its immutability. So, if Nestorius, and then certainly the Nestorians, are emphasizing that the only unity that exists between the divine nature and the human nature in Christ is a unity on the level of the wills, right? Which would be could be called a moral union or a uh, psychological union or a volitional union. This is a word meaning having to do with the wills. Something like this. The idea is that the only thing connecting the divine and the human natures in Christ is this is a union on the level of cooperating wills. If that's what's going on over here, then what Cyril is going to want to advocate is a deeper union. That it's got to be deeper than that. It's got to be a union between the divine and human that mean that they it can't be separated. This this oil and vinegar thing is not going to work, right? And so. It has to be a union on the level of Christ's very personhood, which simply is a way of saying you can't have two persons, you've got to have one person. It has to be a unity of person. So the, the, the term that will be used for a personal union, I'm just going to put this over here. It doesn't belong in this box because it really belongs in the middle, but I'm going to put it here. Um, you could certainly call it a personal union in English. In Greek, it's this word hypostasis, or a hypostatic union. So the hypostatic union is this union on the level of Christ's very personhood. That we, we emphasize the, the unity of the one person of Christ, who has two natures, but those natures are unified so that there's, they're, they're united in one person. Which brings us to the third ecumenical council. Uh, before we go there, let me see if, if we have any questions so far, because I know this is deep philosophical stuff, so make me explain it if I haven't yet. Any questions so far? No? All right, okay. Yeah, okay, well, if you have a question, you can ask it, if not... I have to still form it. Yeah, yeah I know. It, yeah. it might be too early for questions. I, uh, that's okay. All right, so... <coughs> So we come now to the third ecumenical council, which is the Council of Ephesus. Can anyone tell me where this was held? Yeah, Ephesus, thank you, okay. Uh, in the year 431, 431. Now remember, uh, as I always say, I'm not you know, a big stickler on dates, but if there are any dates from church history that you should remember, 325, 381, 431, going to be one more before we're done today. Um, the Third Ecumenical Council was convened by the Emperor Theodosius II and presided over by Cyril of Alexandria with authority from Celestine of Rome. So even though Celestine doesn't go, he sort of still has this, um, there's this assumption that, that he has authority there. That, that Cyril presides on his authority. Um, okay, so Nestorius is excommunicated. That was Celestine's no job number one for Cyril, make sure you excommunicate Nestorius. Um, so Nestorius is excommunicated. Uh, 
the condemnation of Apollinarius from the Council of Constantinople in 381 is affirmed. Right? So now, now we have this. We know, uh, we know this isn't going to work because it's not a full two natures, not a full humanity. Uh, also because the one will thing is not going to work. Right? Um, we know this is also not going to work because of the, uh, the, the fact that this is, does not have a, uh, a personal union or a hypostatic union. But, uh, you know, to Nestorius' credit, you know, this is correct, and this is correct according to the Council. Christ does have two natures. Christ does have two wills. It's just that the union of the two natures has to be a deeper union than, than simply a moral union or a psychological union. And so you see, ultimately, though the you know, council obviously didn't describe it this way, this is me describing it this way, but ultimately, Nestorius has too much distinction and not enough unity of, between the two wills. Apollinarius has too much unity and not enough distinction. Uh, between the two wills. And so that the orthodox balance of unity and distinction between the two wills is Cyril's hypostatic union. And that, that concept is affirmed as the correct understanding of Christ as uh, two natures with a union on the level of his very personhood. Uh, so it's, it's not just a psychological or moral or volitional union, it's a complete union. Okay. Um, now, Nestorius and his supporters actually went off and had their own council, and they excommunicated Cyril. But because the um, official council had the backing of the emperor, Theodosius II, um, he stepped in. He actually arrested both Nestorius and Cyril, but then when it became clear that Cyril was the one backed by Rome, Cyril was released, and Nestorius was exiled. All right. Now, you'd think that would be enough, but it's not. Because we really actually have one more box to fill in here. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing great. All right. Well, you know how this works. The pendulum's going to swing to the other side now. Someone is going to react against uh, Nestorianism, as it comes to be called, and in fact, again, from the perspective of the middle, uh, will overreact. And this guy's name is Eutyches. Now, he's not a bishop. He's a monk from Constantinople. So he's, you know, he's right in Nestorius' backyard there. Um, and... Basically, he's reacting against Nestorius. And so if Nestorius or Nestorianism is an emphasis on the distinction between the two natures, Eutyches is going to react against that by emphasizing the unity of the two natures. But he, he pushes the unity of the two natures farther than Apollinarius did, to the point where not only doesn't he have two natures, he doesn't even have one and a half natures. What he suggests sounds like the divine nature hasn't just overshadowed the human nature like Apollinarius, it's completely absorbed the human nature, so there's no human nature left. So in effect, he ends up with only one nature. Now, he would say that there were two natures to start with, but as soon as they touch, as soon as they connect, the divine nature absorbs the human nature. And the, the critique from from the middle is going to be, well, if that's the case, you take these, then you, the one nature you're left with is sort of a new thing entirely. It's like, uh, you know, an alloy of some kind where you've got, you know, uh, copper and zinc, you put them together and you get brass. But brass is neither copper nor zinc anymore. So it's, it's like that. It's like um, the, uh, well, there's a, there's a Latin term for this. <laughs> A tertium quid, a third thing, a completely different thing. But the point is, is that the, uh, the human nature seems to be absorbed into the divine nature so that there, we're now to the point where there's no humanity left. Uh, whatever humanity was there is sort of deified in the incarnation and turned into this third thing. So, with one nature, we've got a Greek word for that, 
Um, if one will is monophylite, one nature is monophysite. So monophysite Christology is one nature Christology. It's one nature after the union, and that nature is all divine, which means effectively that um, monophysite Christology has, uh, is, you're left with a Christ that has no humanity anymore. Um, and it, it looks, I suppose, something like the Christ of the modalists, but it's different from modalism because it doesn't necessarily conflate all three persons of the Trinity into one thing. But, but, it, but what modalism did with the Trinity, Eutychianism, or monophysitism, does with the two natures of Christ. Does that make sense? So it, we're, we're sort of rehashing the same arguments, although before they were about the relationship between Father and Son, now they're about the relationship between humanity and divinity within the Son. And so um, the critique from the mainstream, of course, is that if the humanity absorbs, is absorbed, Jesus is not really human. He may be homoousios with God, but he's not homoousios with humanity anymore. He's not consubstantial with humanity. He's not one of us anymore. And again, if he's not one of us, how can he be a representative of us? How can he be our savior? Um, all of that. So um, all of those same problems. Now, to be fair, Eutyches was trying to be a good Cyrillian. He was trying to follow Cyril, but he either misinterpreted Cyril or he simply refused to say anything Cyril didn't say. So when he was confronted and he said, okay, Eutyches, well, is Christ consubstantial with humanity? Since he couldn't remember any place where Cyril said that Christ was, he couldn't say that Christ was. So in a sense, you know, maybe Eutyches was in over his head, not a bishop. Um, he was the abbot of the monastery, but he's basically a monk. He's not clergy. Maybe, um, maybe not a theologian. And so, um, so in reality, you know, Cyril, Apollinarius, Eutyches, not a real tight, you know, uh, borders between them. It's kind of fuzzy borders. And, you know, as I already said, Nestorius may have gotten a, uh, a bad rap. So the farther we go in these debates, the harder it becomes to really define what heresy is anymore. It used to be, oh, back in the second and third century, it was so easy. Now it's difficult. But at any rate, here's where we are. And, and, um, and, and so that ultimately this is going to lead us to yet another ecumenical council. So just like you had the Council of Nicaea, but that didn't really settle the issue and you had to have the Council of Constantinople, same thing here. We had the Council of Ephesus, but that didn't quite do the trick, so we're going to have to have the Council uh, of Chalcedon that, that, we'll, that we'll come to. Um, though I failed to mention, and I didn't say it specifically, that the Council of Ephesus did also uh, decree that it is appropriate to call Mary Mother of God. And in fact, um, the, uh, some, of the, some of the most ancient churches dedicated to Mary were founded at this time. Um, so, you know, in the, in the uh, older denominations, Roman Catholic, uh, Greek Orthodox, the other Eastern denominations, um, Mary is considered Mother of God. That is, that's a legitimate title for her. Okay. Um, yes, question. Um, are they starting sainthood? I mean, are they starting, did she get that title? Or? Well, that's a good question. Um, Mary is always, you know, a little bit of different than the rest of the saints. But, um, you know, the, the idea of sainthood, we'll, we'll talk about this more in a couple of weeks, but uh, the idea of sainthood really starts during the persecutions. Um, there's an assumption that, you know, because martyrdom is sort of a, a guaranteed salvation, you know, if you're martyred, it doesn't matter what you've done in your life, uh, you know, this, you, you've guaranteed salvation. So um, the martyrs are kind of like... Um, the, the people that you know for sure are in the kingdom. Because remember, going back to Paul's letters, all Christians are called saints, right? 
But the problem is, is you don't really know with any one individual if they might have lost their salvation through sin. So the only people you know for sure who are saints are the martyrs. And so the tradition develops of, of attaching that title to the martyrs because you know for sure. And then after the persecutions are over, the um, monasticism becomes the new martyrdom. So the, the ascetics will be called saints because they're seen as having, they didn't give their lives literally, but they gave their lives in the sense of giving up their lifestyle for Christ. So they, they become, and so it sort of goes from there. But Mary is always a little bit different because she doesn't fall into either of those categories. Um, but because of her, her specific place in the gospel story and her, you know, uh, having given birth to Jesus, she is, you know, considered one of the sort of saints for sure. Um, but at this point, you don't really see that used as a title yet for her. Not that I can think of. So, so uh, Mother of God is, is uh, goes back at least to the 4th century, if not before. All right, any other questions at this point? How are we doing? You still with me? Okay. Um, now, at this point, we have some political wranglings that go on. For example, um, when Cyril of Alexandria dies, he is uh, succeeded as Bishop of Alexandria by a guy named Dioscorus. And Dioscorus, as you can see from the fact that I wrote him over here, uh, is sort of a follower of Eutyches, or sides with Eutyches. And so what happens is, is the Bishop of Alexandria, when, you know, when the Bishop of Alexandria changes, it goes from, you know, Orthodox to Monophysite. Because for somebody like Dioscorus, again, um, if you look over here, anything that, that has too much distinction between the divine and human natures in Christ is going to look like a four-person trinity. I mean, that's the concern from these guys. These guys are looking over here. In fact, these guys are looking at the middle, and they're saying, you have a trinity of four persons, Father, Holy Spirit, and then the, you know, the two natures of Christ. And that's their, that's their concern. So, so Dioscorus leans heavily on that end. At about the same time, a new bishop uh, comes to Antioch. His name is Flavian. Well, just like it sounds. Flavian. Um, he's Orthodox. So now we have a, a Monophysite bishop in Alexandria and an Orthodox bishop in Antioch. And um, they will have their issue with each other, and they also will appeal to the Bishop of Rome. Except now the Bishop of Rome is Leo. Leo I, uh, also known as Leo the Great, and he's on your handout in the middle as well. He's He's the next one that, that carries the, uh, the mainstream or the orthodox position forward. Leo was bishop of Rome from 440 to 461. And he wrote a letter in support of Flavian in this controversy. And this letter is known as his tome, T-O-M-E. Leo's tome. And in the tome, he does a couple of things. One thing he does is he takes language, now remember, he's the Bishop of Rome, so he's a Westerner. So he takes language that he's getting from Tertullian and Novation, and then also from Cyril. So you've got eternal generation, you've got consubstantiality, you've got hypostatic union, you've got all of the orthodox pieces right in this tome. So that's one thing he does. The other thing he does is he writes it as though he has the authority to tell these other bishops what to do and what to believe. He writes it as if he speaks for Peter because he's the Bishop of Rome. And in fact, um, you know, claims authority even over the other, uh, even over the other metropolitans. Now, there was a synod, you know, this is just a minor thing. There was a synod held in Ephesus in 449, where um, basically Dioscorus was in charge, and um, they received Leo's tome, but it was never even read. 
and I don't know, maybe they didn't have anyone who could read Latin, I don't know. But, um, but uh, that was 449. By the next year, the tome had been translated and would be ready for the Fourth Ecumenical Council, the Council of Chalcedon in 451. All right, I'm going to uh, make myself some space here. All right, I'll just, this is not an historianism, I'll just make a line here. Council of Chalcedon, uh, there is a place called Chalcedon, it's uh, not far from Constantinople. Um, Council of Chalcedon, the year was 451, again, another date, everyone should know whether they care or not, and um, convened by the new emperor, whose name was... <coughs> I even hesitate to tell you. Uh, his name was Marcion. Not to be confused with the Marcion, the heretic from the second century. He was M-A-R-C-I-O-N. This guy is M-A-R-C-I-A-N. He was the emperor. Not a big deal. But, um, but anyway, again, I just to notice how these ecumenical councils are convened by emperors. Because when they're not, you end up with the, the Synod of 449 in Ephesus, which comes to be called the Robber Synod because um, basically at the Robber Synod, Dioscorus was in charge and um, at that synod they said Eutyches is a great guy and Leo's excommunicated. So they tried to excommunicate the Bishop of Rome. Well, that wasn't going to stick, obviously, <laughs> but, you know, I, so you can see why that, that didn't work out. So in order to make these things stick, the legitimate councils are convened by the emperors. So, we, we come to the Council of Chalcedon then, 451, with um, you know, sort of an agenda of affirming the decisions made at the previous councils. So Nestorius is going to be, uh, his, his theory is going to be considered heresy. Apollinarius is considered heresy. Eutyches is also going to be considered heresy. Um, why? Because of what we've known from the beginning, Christ has to be fully human and fully divine. So anything over here isn't going to work because Christ isn't fully human. Um, at the same time, the union of humanity and divinity within the person of Christ um, it has to be a real union. So this stuff is not unified enough, but it can't be so unified that it creates some third thing. So at the council, Leo's tome was read. And, uh, you know, Depending on which account you read, you know, the, some of the, the uh, sort of minutes from the council say that, you know, uh, they read the tome and everyone all in unison stood up and cheered and says, you know, Peter has spoken through Leo and everyone all agreed. Yeah, maybe that happened. Um, other versions of the story are like, well, they really didn't want to agree because they didn't want to submit to Leo's authority or seem like they were, but in the end they realized that what he was saying was, uh, was right, was the way they wanted to go. And so in the tome, um, I'll just point this out, I think you're going to read it. I think that's on your reading list. It's not very long. But what I want to point out is the way, um, the way Leo says that Christ is one person in two natures. He actually says in both natures, but the, the official language is going to be one person in two natures. Now, just like a lot of times, the small words are really important. Because if they were to say one person out of two natures, Eutyches would agree with that. Oh yeah, he's one person made out of two natures, but after the union there's only one nature. Um, so it, it has to be worded so that the two natures retain their distinction even after the union, even after the incarnation. So one person in two natures. And this little phrase rules out both, both extremes because the in two natures rules out the heavy unity. The one person rules out the heavy distinction. At least that's, you know, that's the way it's understood. <clears throat> Um, and so, Leo's phrase is taken up, and uh, along with other, um, other other ways of saying it that have been around for a while, are sort of collected into 
uh, a kind of a statement of faith, but it's not really a creed because at the Council of Chalcedon they were deliberate in their uh, that they were not uh, in, intending to write a new creed because part of the whole deal was to reinforce what had already been done. So we already have the creed from Nicaea and Constantinople. There's no need to write another creed. So what you have is what's called the Chalcedonian definition. It, it's, a, it's something of a statement of faith, but it's not a creed. It just meant to define uh, Orthodox Christology. One person in two natures. And it further clarifies that uh, the two natures, the union of the two natures, cannot have any confusion or change. So the two natures can't be confused or changed or create a third thing. But they also can't be separated. So however you conceive of this, however you understand this or interpret this, it cannot be interpreted in a way that diminishes either the humanity or the divinity of, uh, of Christ. So the union is a real personal union against Nestorianism, uh, but the humanity is a full humanity against uh, Apollinarius and Monophysitism. So that Christ has a real human soul, or soul, will, mind, all that. Um, okay, so, uh, Eutyches, who wasn't actually there, uh, was condemned. Uh, Dioscorus was excommunicated and deposed from his see as bishop. And, um, you know, as I said, both of these extremes are declared heresy. Now, in the past, the losers would just sort of skulk away and maybe try to regroup later and try to come back or or they would disappear from the scene as far as we can tell. But those days are gone. Because for the first time at an ecumenical council, uh, really, the, uh, the losers said, fine, we're taking our ball and going home. And so uh, the Monophysites split from the church um, and the, the, uh, the Monophysites were primarily represented by the Egyptians, um, so think, you know, Alexandria, uh, Ethiopia, primarily Egypt and Ethiopia, right? The Nestorians also said, fine, we don't need you, and they left and split from the church and went into Persia, where sometimes they were persecuted, sometimes they were not. Um, Although some Nestorians would have accepted Leo's tome as authoritative, they thought it didn't go far enough. So, um, so the, the, the big irony here is that the very authority that was meant to preserve the unity of the church by, by you know, having solid boundaries around orthodoxy, ultimately the unity broke down. And this is the first real split of the church that's still in existence today. Um, now, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about these different groups just within with the last couple of minutes we have before we take a break. But let me stop there and ask if there are questions so far on the historical situation. Yeah, oh, sorry. Well, this, may not, this is just more of a... What, what, when do we start getting uh, letters from the people that they declare heritage? Like there's, I'm assuming there's no... There's no letters by the stories. There's no letters by, or is it? Yeah, there are. There, oh, yeah, you can you can uh, read some of that, some of the correspondence between Cyril and the stories. Some of that stuff still exists. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I have a question about the bills. So when they say one human in two natures, how about do we need to think there are two bills or one bill on one person? Well, basically, the the orthodox understanding is that the the person of Christ has two natures, each nature has a will or a mind. Mind and will are kind of the same thing. They are own will. Yes, yeah, except the will of the, the mind slash will of the divine nature, because remember, now that's the same divinity as the whole trinity, 
So that is the same mind and will of the whole Trinity. So it's not like the Father has a will, the Holy Spirit has a different will, and the Son, it's, there's one will for the Trinity. But within the person of Christ, there's two wills. The, the will of the divine nature being the one will of the Trinity. Does that make sense? So it's sort of like <laughs> when, when Jesus is in the garden saying, not my will, but your will be done, you can think of that as the Son speaking to the Father, but it's actually, technically, it's just as correct to think of it as the human nature talking to the divine nature. I know it's a little bit, it's getting a little weird, but yeah, that, I mean, technically speaking, that's, that's right. And, yeah, go ahead. Could you go back to what you said about the emperors convening the councils and yeah. how it would have occurred if, it, if they had not been the emperors? Well, I, I'm just saying that um, when, it, it seems like during these times of controversy, when bishops try to convene a council, the councils don't have the authority to make their um, pronouncements stick, really. I mean, it sort of works a little better if you're in Rome because... In the West, you know, Rome is the biggest game in town. But in the East, the uh, the councils that are convened by bishops tend to be limited in their authority to the area of that bishop. So an ecumenical council, if it's going to be a worldwide council, to have worldwide authority over the church, it seems to need the backing of the emperor or the empire. At least that's what it appears. Yeah. And, and where, and it's just assumed that whenever the emperor calls, the, it's, it's pretty much the same reason as like Constantine when to make sure the church is unified. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's political reason. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's political, but of course the emperors want to be involved in the theological stuff too. Um, but yeah, right. It's it's all about the unity, and again, that's the irony. You know, they're setting these, trying to set these boundaries around orthodoxy to maintain the unity of the church, and ultimately. It was, you know, it seems that it was inevitable that, you know, the unity broke down anyway. Now, okay, um, let me just tell you a little bit about these, these groups. Uh, I'll start over here. The Nestorians um, are now known as the Assyrian Church of the East. Um, and they, uh, they're not considered heretics anymore. Um, and I, most of what I know here has to do with relations with the Roman Catholic Church, but... Uh, the, the Assyrian Church of the East is, has been recognized by the Vatican since 1994. Pope John Paul II had a uh, meeting with them, and um, you know, they are recognized as not heretics. They, for their part, agree that the title Theotokos is appropriate for Mary in the sense that it's not heresy, although they reserve the right not to use it. So they won't call Mary Theotokos, Mother of God, but they get what it means and they understand that it's not heresy if, if some other Christians want to do that. Um, the Monophysites are uh, ultimately what we might refer to as the Coptic Church. Coptic is just a word that refers to Egypt and the, the Egyptian language, which is kind of a Greek derivative. Um, technically, they're, they're now called the Oriental Orthodox Churches. But they do not claim to be Monophysites. In fact, they, they will tell you they were met, never Monophysite. That was a misunderstanding. Um, they say, they, they will agree that Eutyches was a heretic, but they do not claim Eutyches as their founder. They claim Dioscorus as their founder. And they say Dioscorus got a bad rap because there was this political... Um, you know, power struggle between him and Cyril. So they, they fully agree that both Apollodarius and Eutyches uh, were heretics, but, um, but they claim Dioscorus was, was really deposed because he opposed the Bishop of Rome, and so, you know, there was the, that political thing. Um, so today they, they would not um, appreciate being called Monophysites. Um, they... Uh, basically agree to the Chalcedonian definition uh, and they agree that, that you know, Christ has a full humanity, that there are two wills in the person of Christ, a human and divine. Um, but they prefer to call themselves Neophysites. So if the, if the accusation was that they were Monophysites, 
meaning one will. They prefer to call themselves neophysites, or that their Christology is neophysite. Nea is uh, the word for one. So instead of being one will, it's one will. Now, you might think that's not different, but it is, because the word mono means like only one, whereas mia is taken to mean uh, one composite will. So, so in other words, it's their way of saying, we still like to emphasize the union of the two wills to the point where we want to talk about the one person of Christ as having one nature. I'm sorry, I keep saying one will, but it's really nature. That's my bad. Um, one nature, one nature. I'm on this will thing. So uh, they want to say, you know, it's not only one nature, but it's one composite nature. And so they, they still want to say that, that they're more comfortable with the union of natures such that, uh, you know, ultimately they want to talk about one nature, but they also still admit that there's two natures in there. So that the two natures still remain. It's, you know, it's a little bit hard to get your head around it. And, um, uh, you know, but, but this is their way of, of saying, you know, they, they recognize the problems with this, um, but they're not quite ready to, uh, you know, to get on board with the way the mainstream was saying it back in the day. So these groups, the, the Coptics and the um, Assyrians, are today they're referred to as non-Chalcedonian churches because they, uh, well, well, we we don't call them heretics anymore. In fact, with the uh, Coptics, um, they've been recognized by the Vatican since 1973 as not a heresy, um, and they've been recognized by the Greek and Russian Orthodox churches as uh, as Orthodox since 1989. So that seems pretty recent in the grand scheme of things, but um, but the point is is that you know we're all agreeing on the Christology. Now they still are considered non-Chalcedonian because they there are other things that that were um, proclaimed at the Council of Chalcedon that they can't get on board with. Um, but the point is is that uh, there there is agreement now among all these groups on the Christology, that the Chalcedonian definition of the description of Christ is, is agreed upon. What we don't have yet is Eucharistic uh, union. I mean, you know, you wouldn't, uh, a Roman Catholic wouldn't receive communion from an Assyrian or, you know, a, um, uh, a Oriental Orthodox. Uh, so, like, if, when I go to the... Um, there, there's a Coptic church on uh, Highway 53 in Rolling Meadows, you know, shiny dome, um, beautiful liturgy, um, pretty much, you know, set aside three hours for that, but it's, it's worth <laughs> going. But I mean, I, if I go, I do not receive communion there um, because we don't have the, uh, the Eucharistic unity, but we do have unity on the definition of Christology. So, um, let me see if there are questions at this point. Make good use of that handout, especially the 5th century Christology handout, because um, I think that lays it out pretty well with the um, uh, monopsite Christology on one side and the story on the other. Right. Any questions? Okay, then let's take a break. It is uh, almost quarter two, so let's, let's start up again at 8 o'clock.